This is Dan Schneider, and on this Dan Schneider video interview, the subject will be racial and sexual identity in modern life, and I will have three people who will talk about that. Uh, they are Nicholas Wade, Sven Bockland, and John Robson, and when I return, we will get more into the subject and more into who they are. Well, I'd like to begin uh, the show by letting each of the three panelists uh, introduce themselves, uh, what they do, who they are, if they have any websites or any books that they want to talk about, too, because we will be uh, referencing them as we go along. So from left to right, let me start with Nicholas Wade. Uh, Nicholas, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit about your career and your book. Um, well, I'm a journalist. I've written about science for the rest of my uh, life. Uh, I started out on Nature, a scientific journal, and then I went to Science, which is its American equivalent. And then uh, I moved to the New York Times, where I've been an editorial writer and uh, and science editor and a science reporter. So in the course of uh, reporting um, the world post-genome, uh, uh, I've looked around for several books uh, to write on subjects that uh, explain how uh, you know, new aspects of the genome. So I've written one on early human history and another on religion and a third one on um, race, which you know, the third that came out um, last year. Uh, Sven Bachland, uh, you are a researcher into, to, I guess, human sexuality, and I had first come upon you uh, about seven or eight years ago in an article in Discover Magazine. Uh, and uh, if you could just tell a little bit about yourself and uh, the research that you do. Yeah, that's right. I'm actually a molecular geneticist, meaning I, I work with DNA. I don't actually talk to people. <laughs> I don't actually uh, find out much about about who they are, but we, we try to figure out how they've become who they are. And we focus in our lab on, uh, on sexual development, and that could be... Um, biological sexual development, so development of testes and ovaries, but we also look at the brain, we look at gender identity, and we've, uh, we've studied uh, brain differences in transsexuals, and my research has been mostly focused on sexual orientation, so what they call the gay gene, or basically the straight genes, because yeah. that's really what it's all about. Yeah, and uh, uh, I, I wanted to interview, because I found that to be an interesting article, and uh, uh, one of the things we will talk about is not only just homosexuality, but things uh, such as uh, Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner and sexual identity. And I know you're not an expert on that per se, but certain of the things that you have researched will certainly have some bearing on that. Uh, getting to that, uh, John Robson, uh, you uh, have a website, uh, your own website, uh, John Robson Online. And uh, I know I found you by looking up an article that you did uh, not on uh, Caitlyn Jenner, but on a woman named Rachel Dolezal, a white woman trying to pass off as black, and you had written an article about it. Um, so if you could give a little background about yourself and uh, any opinions relevant to the topics at hand. Dan, a journalist and documentary maker, my latest project, Magna Carta, Our Shared Legacy of Liberty. You can find it at our documentary online. But I was trained as a historian I worked in academia, I worked in think tanks, and I've always been very interested in the role of ideas and how essential it is to understand what people think about themselves and their society, to understand what they're doing. And one of the ideas that's been enormously influential ever since the 1960s, the coming of the civil rights movement, and the discovery that in the Western world we have been terribly wrong on race, there has been this presumption that existing social institutions, existing social attitudes are necessarily wrong and necessarily harmful, and we just can't wait to find the next barrier to break, the next taboo to transgress. And this has therefore translated over to all kinds of things, including sexuality, since we realized there are no significant differences between whites and blacks. We got that terribly wild. There must be no significant differences between women and the past. This idea now 50 years old, all before it, but it's two places I think are misleading and frequently quite dangerous. And so I pose the challenge of an article. If a man can turn into a woman, why can't a white turn into a black? Especially if you buy into this notion that it's all in the mind, that we are whatever we think we are. I just lost your uh, video, John, if you could turn it back on. I, are you still there, John? I'm still here. Okay, yeah, I, ha I have your picture, but if you can try to get your video back up. Well, let me, uh, let me start with that and uh, uh, go down the panel. Um, 
Uh, and let me start with Nicholas, since uh, he had written a, a book on race. I know I, I'm pretty much a, a social moderate. And uh, uh, while I don't believe that uh, in things like phrenology or whatnot, uh, the, th the thing with race is, to me, it's a superficial thing, but it's also a real thing. And I think a lot of people nowadays uh, in, in the sciences, uh, especially on the left, try to look at uh, race or, or, or racial identity, whatever, whether you're talking about three or four stocks of man, or if you want to talk about nationalities as races or subspecies. It seems to me that people want to gloss over the fact that there are differences that even babies, I, I've read about studies where babies can identify people racially, that just because it's a superficial difference, it's not a real difference. Uh, so, Nicholas, would, is that one of the premises that you've come upon that people uh, either take these hard positions that there are no such thing as a race or that they have these old line sort of 19th century beliefs about race? Well, it certainly would be nice if, if there were no such thing as race that uh, divides our uh, societies. Uh, but uh, race does exist in a biological sense. Uh, although this is frequently uh, denied by many social scientists who claim that, that race is a, is a social construct, not a biological one. Um, so part of the purpose of my book was to look at all the information we have streaming out of the human genome that certainly bears on race and to say, uh, well, race is real, race does exist biologically. Um, so what one makes of that is another matter, but one can uh, define race so precisely that, for example, with people of mixed race, like African-Americans, uh, the genetic system sort of track along their chromosomes, saying, well, this section comes from a, a European parent and this from an African parent, which an exercise that obviously would be impossible if race didn't exist. So in my view, it's much better if social scientists drop this fiction that race doesn't exist biologically and uh, accepted it. Uh, and I argue in my book that this is really uh, no big uh, deal, that in fact, the, the more close you understand race, the more clearly you see that humankind is a single species with just a few minor wrinkles and variations in it. I know a lot of times, like back in the 1990s, there were several books that would, you know, try to link race with intelligence quotient and forgetting the idea that IQ tests to me are, are quite troublesome in, in, in many ways, aside from race. Um, it seems to me that uh, when people make, at least here in the United States of America, uh, when people make uh, broad sweeping assumptions about race, they generally still fall back onto these things that all people are some way or another. Now, it's not the old 19th century standard, but for example, in sports, which, which dominates a, a lot of the American landscape, you now have the idea that, for example, uh, many people of African-American black descent uh, are somehow physically superior to their white counterparts, when to me that seems really kind of silly because if you have a group that's disadvantaged into getting into, say, becoming lawyers or doctors or, or CEOs, they're naturally going to go towards something that's easier to, to succeed in, like sports. And I think the history of American sports, for example, boxing with first Jews, uh, the Irish, uh, Hispanics, blacks, all having their sort of turns in, in a dominant role in those sports, seems to argue for the fact that economic opportunity tends to be behind what we perceive as racial differences. Would you agree with that? Um, uh, yes, to both parts of your statement. Uh, with respect to intelligence, it's certainly uh, true that the IQ issue has sort of poisoned uh, discussion of, of racial differences. And I think uh, it's best to simply acknowledge the fact that although IQ tests do have major validity applied to uh, individuals, uh, for example, in showing sort of correlation between IQ and economic success, it's very hard to uh, compare the IQs of different populations unless you're absolutely sure that all other conditions are the same, which you never are. So it's, it's known that you know, health, for example, is a major factor that affects the IQ scores. Uh, moreover, uh, well, well, just let me uh, just say that you're on very shaky grounds, almost always.
is when you try and compare the IQ scores of different races. So I, it's better to just sort of drop that from the discussion, at least in my view. With respect to sports, I think there is, uh, uh, I think there probably are genetic differences that underlie uh, some uh, uh, sporting facts, for example, the extraordinary predominance of African Americans in um, in the hundred meter uh, sprint, which I think that is, 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 I think I'm right in saying that's sort of dominated by African Americans. Um, uh, you're right that cultural factors, such as the preeminence of Jews in boxing in the 1920s, are often have a major role in sports. But I think if you can assume that once you get to Olympic level in the sort of present day and age, that many of these cultural factors have been ironed out, and you are, in in many cases, seeing a genuine physiological difference between races. And I say that simply on general grounds, since races do differ, and since since some of these differences are, I would say, a little more than superficial, because why should they be just superficial? Well, well that, these races do, do exist, because these differences do exist, there's no reason that every race should perform exactly the same extent in every given athletic activity. Sven, you oh, look my, like, okay, I'm sorry, Sven, you, you look know, like you wanted to say something? Yeah, I have two thoughts that I want to add to that. So I, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson explain that when he told people that he wanted to be a uh, astrophysicist, people said, are you sure you don't want to play basketball instead? And that's, that, that's really that, um, that cultural part that you were mentioning. But I find it personally very fascinating as a geneticist. Um, I'm really interested in um, genetic differences between races, and that's kind of a taboo topic. I don't think people are really very much focused on that. I want to give you two examples. So. Um, Everyone except for Africans has Neanderthaler DNA in them. Yeah. So when we, us humans, a long time ago, uh, traveled north uh, from Africa, um, we encountered Neanderthal- Neanderthalers and had sex with them, quite a, quite a bit of sex apparently, because we have a good percent or so or more of their DNA in us, their genes in us. Now, people from Africa uh, don't have any Neanderthaler DNA in them. We don't really know what difference that that makes. We don't know if that makes any difference. But purely genetically, people from African descent are more uh, pure human than we are. We have some of the earlier species DNA in us. And uh, the other thing that's really interesting is that if you just talk about Africans, so by some measures, two South Africans that come from tribes that are um, 100 miles apart have more genetic diversity between the two of them than between a person of African and Asian or African of European origin, just because that's where the human race evolved. And so there's just a small a small group of people that traveled north and colonized the whole world. Um, where the human race um, evolved, that's where all the genetic diversity is. So it's it's a very complex topic. Yeah. I don't think it's been studied at all. Well, also, Sven, wouldn't it be true that uh, African Americans, as, as they're, they're now called, are going to have a large portion of European DNA in them, you, I mean, versus, say, someone who's a, a, a Khoisan in the southern part of Africa, which would be, you know, a pure African. If you took your average, say, black athlete in America uh, and, and pick, your pick you know, uh, your top basketball player or top baseball player, they are probably going to have 20 to 30, 40 percent European DNA in them because of, ye- of centuries of race mixing. Would that not be so? That's true, yeah. When, I'm, when I was talking about Africans, I meant Africans and not necessarily African Americans. And then there's also another taboo topic of um, kind of what happened to them. And in a way, um, African Americans are part of a, of a breeding experiment where the strongest one were chosen that put through a terrible, stressful physical test. And only the ones who survived were then uh, sold and bred like racehorses in a way. And I think. Um, I think that definitely had some effect as well on, on what what genes we have in the United States and people versus um, back in Africa where they came from. Well, you touch you touch upon a topic that some people do talk about. Uh, uh, Suppose uh, the breeding uh, of of African slaves for strength, and and that's that's something that that's been controversial. Let me, uh, John Robson, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, 
can you uh, do you have have something to add to the things that Sven and Nicholas have talked about? Well, I think that the very important point you make about African Americans is that they are of extreme mixed ancestry, and I think that to the extent that they do excel in sports, uh, I think you may be seeing hybrid vigor rather than anything particularly African. The other point I would make is that when some humans left Africa, one of the things that became a very real physical priority was not being cold. And you sacrifice a certain amount of speed and agility for the sake of retaining your bodily warmth. I speak as someone of probably Scottish descent, and obviously the being shaped like a barrel is an impediment when you're sprinting, but it's something of an advantage in the Outer Hebrides. Uh, so I think that the primary driver of evolution among humans Many, many years ago, we put most of our eggs in the basket of intelligence, and particularly of skill and cooperation, and doing things well together and detecting cheaters. And that evolutionary pressure has been the same on everybody, regardless of where they lived. And that is why I think that you do see some physical differences. Again, you look at sprinting results at the Olympics, people of West African descent tend to dominate. Long distance runners, people of East African descent. And... You know, you just you don't bet on the Scotsman in the hundred yard dash. You just don't. But when it comes to the things that really matter to us living together as human beings, what you're looking at is a result of intellectual and psychological evolutionary pressures that were the same virtually everywhere. Well, let me turn back to Sven and, and, and talk about a sexuality for a moment because this year that we were recording, twenty fifteen, in the United States of America, uh, the Supreme Court of the US did legalize gay or homosexual marriage after about a 10-year legal battle. And I, and I have to say, I, I was frankly stunned. I'm, I'm, I'm of a so, socially liberal bent, so I, I always supported that, uh, and I, I'd also support polygamy or anything else between consenting adults. But uh, I thought it was going to take about 25 years, frankly, that it would happen. I think it was some brilliant legal strategy. But I know in, in the article that I first uh, uh, found Sven in some years ago, one of the things that I found interesting was in the 1990s, you had the idea of a gay brain or a gay gene. Recently this year, there was uh, uh, two or three months ago, there was a, a recurrence of the idea that there was, a, a, if not a gay gene, a, a sequence of genes that if they fell into line could produce uh, uh, someone or at least a male who is homosexual. So let me just uh, talk about uh, the scientific basis for homosexuality versus any cultural basis. And one of the things I know, having been in the arts for 30 years, is there's always been a divide between male homosexuals and female homosexuals, with a lot of female homosexuals or lesbians always taking a political stance about their sexuality, you know, the whole kind of man-hating thing and th that they chose uh, lesbianism. What, what in your research, Sven, do you uh, see in terms of sexuality where we are in 2015, and what is the likelihood, do you think, that there is a biological basis somehow, whether it's genetic or something else, uh, for uh, human homosexuality. Well, I will address the differences between men and women uh, in a second, and remind me of it if I if okay. I um, But I, I think the best way to think about sexuality uh, is, is not so much about thinking about homosexuality, but just about heterosexuality. And once you think of that, it's obvious that that's genetic. Uh, if you look around in the world, um, animals come in two species. That's not a coincidence. Could have been three or five, but there's two. And um, it's highly conserved. And um, for them to reproduce, for species to continue existing, the males have to mate with the females. So that means you somehow have to know what your sex is, what the sex is of another individual that you encounter is, and then whether that means you want to stick body parts into each other. And, and so that mechanism must be very old and very conserved. And, and a crocodile is not straight because of their upbringing or the school, school they go to or what religion their parents belong to a crocodile street because that's what they are. And I think so that on a, on a very primitive level, um, that is just the same for us. I think there's there's genes that regulate sexual orientation, and we know at least of two. We know of one on the X chromosome, and we know of one on chromosome 8. And uh, But frankly, that's all we know. We have no idea how they work. We have no idea what these genes do. And we have no, no idea what effect they have on our, on our brains. But we know that they exist, that there's uh, variations in these genes that are correlated with being gay in men, at least. And, um, and again, if you think about the animal kingdom, it's kind of obvious that um, that's the, the, the core fundamental interaction is somehow regulated biologically. 
Well, let, before we get to the male versus female homosexual, let me just ask you a question, and you can tell me if I'm full of shit or not. Um, I've always had cats, and oftentimes with my male cats, they get into, you know, the dominance male sex play. One of them mounts the other, bites on the um, on the scruff of the other, and make tries to make them submit. Now, if you're far enough away, that looks like a sex act. And I'm wondering if it's possible that in a cultural sense, homosexuality may have, at least male homosexuality, may have developed from some of that. Because human beings, since we uh, developed an intellect that can know the self rather than just follow these drives that my cats follow, uh, could that, could that, could homosexuality have developed out of what was essentially dominance play between, let's say between, uh, you know, uh, uh, homo sapiens, uh, predecessors? Well, that's a, that's a, a tricky question. Um, <laughs> my first thought is, is no, that doesn't no. sound right to me, but, um, let me think if I have anything clever or scientifically to say about that. So, if, if you are 14 years old and you realize that you're attracted to guys and not to girls, or not so much to girls, typically at that age, I think at that point that has very little to do with whether an ancestor wanted to dominate another ancestor. I think at that point um, that is purely a, a, an, an attraction that, that you, you didn't choose, that you don't know what to do with typically. And so, so that's... It's a non-answer, but I, I think what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't really matter where that came from, I think, um, because we can't, we'll never be able to answer that question. Okay, and uh, let's get back to then uh, lesbians versus male homosexuality. Um, as I said, after three decades in the arts, back in the 1990s especially, I know there was sort of like, a there was always almost a militant divide between a lot of lesbians and male homosexualities with this sort of, uh, I guess, I guess maybe shows like the Oprah Winfrey show talk more openly about supposed the sexual abuse of women. And a lot of women would claim uh, that they became lesbians because they had been abused as children and whatnot. Do you look back on that now with, with 15 or 20 years hindsight and say, well, that was just a sort of political posturing. Is there, do you believe uh, as strong uh, a scientific basis for female homosexuality as for male homosexuality? When, when my, Colleagues and, and kind of predecessors in this in this research uh, started studying sexual orientation from a biological point of view. They they started working with men and with women. And what they found was that if you ask questions like uh, "Who are you attracted to?" when you walk on the street, you turn your head for someone. Is that a man or a woman? Uh, who do you fantasize about? Who do you actually uh, uh, have sex with? Uh, if you ask these questions to men and women, uh, for men you get a, a very uh, extreme. A pattern where you have people on one end of the spectrum and people at the other end of the spectrum, and very, very few guys in between. If you ask the exact same questions to women, you get an entirely different distribution where the majority of women is somewhere in the middle, and there's very little on the extreme. And so, um, on top of that, women seem to be, most women, not all of them, seem to have some flexibility that men don't have, and they can actually cross um, and, and can say, well, I'm done with men, let me try dating women. Uh, there's very few men that can actually do that, that can make that conscious decision. So I think in general, again, there, there's a lot of exceptions, but in general, I think female sexuality is a lot more fluid and there's a lot more room for conscious uh, decision making and they can make it work somehow in a way that men can't. Well, that's a good segue. Let me just turn to John Robson to end this segment because you're talking about uh, uh, women uh, and, and fluidity. Uh, the article you had written upon this woman, Rachel Dolezal, who was pretending to be black, uh, I think is a perfect example. There's a, there was a term that came in the 1990s in America with rap music lovers who weren't black called wiggers or white niggers. And uh, where a lot of suburban white kids pretended that they were black and they would talk in black slang and that kind of thing. Um, what, what, what is your take on someone like a Dolezal and you had, in your article, you had talked about, uh, and you just earlier mentioned that you felt that uh, uh, there was, if people can pretend, or uh, Bruce Jenner wants to claim that he's female gender, even though he's male sex, why can't Dolezal claim a different cultural heritage? Um, so I guess my question is, uh, where do you, uh, what, what are your uh, thoughts, John, about that? Uh, do you think that uh, 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 race or, or Ethnicity is as fluid as sexuality for most people. 
Johnny, still there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. The last question broke up, but I, I find that we've got this backwards in the modern world. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That we treat gender as non-existent and race as existent and say that, oh, these white kids are acting black as though there was some inherent way of being black. In fact, if you look at black American culture, you see strong traces of the acculturation of slaves primarily, but also free blacks, into what is essentially hillbilly culture. That the people most willing to associate socially with slaves would have been the, the people in the backcountry and the, the style of speech, the attitudes towards gender, uh, level of, of violence, all kinds of things match up quite closely because human beings really are all the same under the skin. And so if somebody comes along and finds a humorous way of talking, you're liable to adopt it. It doesn't matter if this is, you know, you find some Jewish comedian funny and you, you start to adopt some of those rhythms, though you're not Jewish or you find the speech of some cultural group exceptionally to the point, and you think, that, that's directness. I should be more like that. But when it comes to gender, everybody has always known that men and women are different. You know, vive la différence. That used to be the French slogan. Now it's like, near la différence or something. And the, when you get to the, the question of homosexuality and how homosexuality works, the question that used to, I think, be asked legitimately is, well, where does it fit on the male-female spectrum? For instance, when gay marriage was first being pushed as a major issue, and activists would say, our relationships are just the same as yours. And I thought, okay, there must be a husband and a wife in a relationship. They may both be male, they may both be female, but, you know, one picks up the newspaper, the other one starts to talk, well, as it is with men and women. But then somebody said, oh, no, no, there aren't men and women. There's no such thing. There's no continuum. There's no spectrum. There's no characteristic male behavior or female behavior. There's no more typical male kind of brain organization. Um, and so th that was all just abolished. And at the same time, we turned around and said, oh, but there is such a thing as blackness. You're not really black if, or in Canada, where Aboriginal issues are very big. You know, you're not a real Aboriginal if, or, you know, the red man has a special relationship with the earth. And I think, what are you saying? If I'm white, I should dump paint in the river? Good grief. If I come along and discover that some culture understands better than I do how to respect nature, I want to respect nature. I should learn from them. Or again, you know, some Aboriginal society has had enough of that stuff and goes and gets a job in a bank and say, oh, you're an apple, you know, you're red on the outside, white on the inside, as though culture were not meant to be fluid and we shouldn't all adopt best practices. So I think we've got it completely backwards and it brings up all kinds of questions about race. And you, you mentioned polygamy, we'll get back to that, I'm sure. I mean, in some sense, if there's no such thing as gender, why not polygamy? But also, if there's no such thing as gender, why are most of us either heterosexual or homosexual? Why are we all just all over the map? Because we're not. Yeah. Well, uh, let's end this segment. I just want my, my one comment to, to you, John, is that I know uh, one of the things here in America, we have a, a, a term called uh, the magical Negro that's come along in the last few years with generally uh, uh, films and, and television shows which show supposedly uh, uh, nature in touch black people uh, guiding along stupid white folks. And I know that probably that a predecessor of that is sort of what the, the Native American, uh, or as you call them in Canada, the First Nations uh, peoples who are in touch with uh, with uh, nature. But it should be stated that uh, the destruction of North American megafauna happened about 10,000 years ago, and it, there were no white people in America at the time. The people who likely drove those animals to extinction were the ancestors of uh, the, the nature-loving uh, uh, Native Americans. Um, but uh, let's end this segment. I want to get back. I want to uh, start talking about uh, race from a historical perspective. I want to talk a bit more about Nicholas's book and uh, how race has been perceived over the centuries, as well as sexuality. And we'll do that in a moment. In this segment, I would like to sort of take a, a step back and uh, uh, talk about both race and sexuality from a more uh, historical perspective over the last few centuries. And uh, let me start with uh, Nicholas. Uh, oh, welcome back, John. Let me start with uh, Nicholas. Uh, and let's talk about uh, specifically American, but I guess we could call the new world views on, on race. So if you want, uh, if we could go back even uh, a couple of thousand years, because uh, I don't think the modern idea of race was as relevant, uh, you know, say in the Roman era. They, when they spoke of races, they would speak of barbarians, the Romans, the Africans, uh, or, or whatnot. Um, so what, what is the history of, of human idea about race, say, going back centuries, uh, Nicholas? Um, well, you'd probably need to be a better historian than I am to uh, give a really 
good answer to that. Um, I think uh, races become much more important in recent uh, times with increasing sort of travel and exploration. So it's only, it's in, only in the 19th century. Uh, we lost Nicholas Wade, uh, but hopefully we'll uh, get him back uh, in a few minutes and we'll uh, get back to a bit more historical uh, uh, perspective on race. Um, let me uh, then uh, start then uh, with that topic and uh, start with John Robson. Uh, uh, John, uh, you you have uh, taken, a, I guess you would say, a, a different position than Nicholas uh, has regarding race. Uh, since you live in Canada, let's talk a little bit about how maybe race is viewed differently uh, to our neighbors to the north. Um, uh, Canada is a diverse nation, but it's about one tenth the size of America. I, I think it outlawed slavery uh, maybe uh, decades, if not a century, before America, and probably uh, racial uh, issues in Canada probably have more to do with Native Americans or First Nations people, as uh, you call them. Would uh, would that be correct? I'm terribly sorry that uh, that question broke up too much. I didn't oh, get it. Oh, I was saying that in Canada. Uh, racial issues probably have more to do with uh, the white majority Canadians and First Nations peoples and things like the the upper territories and that kind of thing than it would do to say with black and white here in America would be that would that be fair to say? Yeah, on the whole, that is true. Canada was uh, you know, primarily white, with the exception of the first inhabitants, and there were issues. For instance, there was uh, with Chinese immigration, there was some serious hostility there. And, well, Canada, you know, the main black population would have been fugitive slaves until really you start to get into the 20th century. But, you know, Canada is part of the West and Canada has the same virtues and many of the same uh, defects as Western civilization, including a, a hostility to people based on race. And it's true, this was touched on in the last segment, that, you know, the ancient world didn't think of race the same way. There was certainly a certain amount of ethnic hostility and, uh, you know, somebody once advised Romans not to buy Britons as slaves because they're too stupid. But, you know, if you went down to the slave market in Rome, you'd, you'd see the ethnic group they just conquered would be on sale. They didn't have this idea that, oh, yeah, this group or that group are born to be slaves. That's a, that's a Renaissance horror. This notion of Africans is somehow specially suited to it. It's a complicated historical problem how it arose, but it left us with this idea, and then you get into this 19th century scientific racism that starts to claim that there are inherent differences between people that are not based on culture. I mean, yeah, all the people who have a certain appearance may tend to have a certain kind of behavior because people in one place have one culture, people in another place have another culture, but the idea that it was somehow linked to our genes, and that if you had a certain skin color and a certain facial bone structure, you would think a certain way, that is quite a modern idea. It's not all progress, you know, and finally, I think we're ridding ourselves of that, but it was, that is really a product of the last 500 years, not the last 5,000 or the last five. Yeah. Um, let me, tur let me turn to, okay, go ahead, Sven. You got a dog? That <laughs> okay. Hold, hold on. Uh, so Sven, um, let me, let me uh, talk about um, uh, the idea of uh, sexuality uh, uh, throughout history. When I was a kid, I remember seeing uh, in America, there was a, uh, a PBS special about the life of a, a famous uh, homosexual in Victorian England called Quentin Crisp. And uh, it was there that uh, I think in Victorian England that we got a lot of sort of the modern negative stereotypes about sort of the swishy kind of uh, homosexual, the, the flit or the fag or the fairy, those kinds of terms. Whereas when you look back a few thousand years ago, no one had any idea, say, uh, about Alexander the Great and the Macedonian sort of prancing through Persia as they slaughtered thousands. So, um, and I, I've also, you know, read about like what they call the, the gay lisp or the gay accent. Are these generally modern affectations uh, that, that you would say, or are these things that have been around but, but simply weren't noted by the dominant uh, uh, scribes of the day? That's a good question. I, I don't know about what, what happened in older times. And uh, some things I think we just, <laughs> no disrespect to historians, but some things we just can't really figure out because we can't change what's been recorded back then. What I, what I can tell you is that there definitely are some biological differences between gay and straight men on average and also between um, gay and straight women on average with a lot of exceptions so um, 
when you study things like uh, speech or um, even posture or the way, uh, if you put people on a treadmill and put these little dots on them so you only see the outlines, uh, you can actually, with some success, um, figure out whether someone is gay or straight just by looking at their gait. Mm. So there is um, there's some of that that's definitely, that, that, that must be biological in a way that um, there are, uh, they already are caught at a young age sometimes with, with kids that are then in, um, in later studies turn out to be gay. Um, I, I was involved um, a long time ago in, in organizing uh, gay summer camps uh, for kids that have never seen another gay guy before, ever. And they would show up with their mixtapes and they, they bring ABBA tapes. This is, uh, this is in Europe. And you think, how is that possible? How can someone who's never spoken with another gay man in their life, how can they be obsessed with ABBA music, disco? Um, like, the, I, I don't understand how that could be biological, but somehow there seems to be something interesting going on. Um, so uh, there's definitely a culture as well, and a, a subculture in a way, and people pick up um, traits that they they think they need to develop their identity, and I think sometimes um, some gay men, when they come out and they start going to gay bars or, or, or get involved in, in the gay scene, they, they pick up these more um, effeminate or, or um, yeah, characteristics of speech, just like you were discussing earlier, you know, you, you pick up these kind of things. So I think it's a bit of a combination of two. Uh, and, and why that was not much described before, I have no idea. Well, I mean, there are certainly uh, uh, professional athletes, boxes, uh, NFL football players that, that are gay, and uh, they wouldn't fit sort of that. Uh, I mean, would, would they, if, if you were to, to, to mark out their gate, would they fit into that thing that you were talking about? Yeah, not, not, not at all. And, and the interesting part is that in, in these traits, like gait and speech and all that, where you have more masculine and more feminine traits, when you look at gay men, you just have a much wider spectrum. Mm -hmm. So um, there's no difference in the extremes. There's there's hyper masculine gay men as well, and and athletes, top athletes as well. But there's just a, a broader range. And again, we don't really understand how that works biologically, but we definitely see that. And what what would the correlation be to these uh, more outwardly, seemingly possibly affected traits to say being in the closet or being out or being a flamer? Uh, uh, versus, you know, is, is there any kind of correlation? And how would that, for example, would you plot that on a chart of, say, uh, bisexuality? Because I've known a lot of, uh, especially gay men, who are, who are like, you know, bisexuality is bullshit and, you know, you know just take a choice. But, you know, I, I, would, I would have to assume, you know, that I've, I've known some people who claim to have been asexual, that they just don't feel any sexual attraction. Um, uh, so uh, are all of these kinds of things, whether we're talking bisexuality, homosexuality, um, uh, asexuality, uh, are, are there po possibly notable markers uh, that could be detected or just haven't been detected yet? All right. There were a whole lot of questions in that question. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's start with um, being in the closet or not, uh, depending on, on how masculine or feminine you are. Well, well definitely, if, if you are... Um, what you what you call flaming? Um, kid, kids like that get get really called gay before they realize it. In school, they get bullied a lot more, and so they end up being out a lot more. Uh, guys that fit in better and develop more masculine definitely uh, are, are often uh, come out much later because a, they don't have to, but also because they are even more confused. They 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 know that they don't fit in with what they perceive as as gay stereotypes. Um, your question about bisexuality, so it's a, it's a bit of a complicated topic, but people that have studied this carefully with, um, you can you can do brain scans to see which part of your brain get excited when you show images of men or women. You can do the same thing by measuring the blood flow in the penis or blood flow in the vagina. And what they find is that um, there's really very, very few true bisexual men. They exist, but um, the overwhelming majority of people that call themselves bisexual um, are kind of found the one of the buy now gay later category um, where, where people identify as bisexual because it's easy, it's a step towards uh, being gay without really having to give up the chance of heterosexual relations. So um, so it's definitely um, for, for many a developmental stage. And then there's also hypersexual 
straight men really who are just so into sex that they like having sex with guys uh, it's easier to find um, and then of course there's a true bisexuals but they're they're small it's a really small hard to find group in men at least um well since we're talking about race and sexuality here let me just uh, step back and before i go back to john um do you have you found in all of your research are there any ethnic groups uh, that tend to have a higher percentage, perhaps, of homosexuality. For example, I've heard that uh, a lot of the the Pacific Islander cultures are very more tolerant of homosexuality than a lot of Western societies. And does that perhaps propagate someone who might be sitting on the fence in that society to, to become homosexuality? Or is it something that's sort of just fluid and, you know, over the, the decades I've heard about... Uh, uh, I forget the term, but uh, in Native American societies, there were men who were thought of as females and whatnot. Um, and we, we'll lead this back into the, the Bruce Jenner and Rachel Dolezal thing. But is do, do you find that uh, anything having to do with ethnicity or race plays a part in anyone's sexuality? Well, you gave a number of examples that are, that are well known and some of them are well studied, where different cultures deal with this identity in a different way, because the identity, of course, is a, is a, is a social construct. Um, I think the instincts are, are largely biological. Um, getting a, an exact count is very difficult because it's uh, it depends on the questions you ask, and different cultures will define these questions differently. Um, there are some um, Muslim cultures where having sex uh, before marriage between a man and a woman um, could uh, could cause you to get killed, and people there have sex with um, in, in, in some rural cultures with with either animals or with uh, with other males a lot more often. That doesn't make them any more gay. That is just because that's what's available. So I think it's very hard to ask standardized questions about sexual identity that that, that apply to any culture on this planet, and therefore it's hard to compare them. I think. Let me turn back to John and uh, race, because uh, in 2015, as as I stated, we had uh, the legalization of gay marriage in America. And then uh, a former athlete named Bruce Jenner, and I say this because even though people would know the name now, uh, 20 or 30 years from now, if they're looking on YouTube, they may not, uh, uh, came out. But he didn't come out as homosexual. He came out as a straight guy who just wanted to change his gender, which is a, a different topic. And we'll get back to that in, in a bit. But there was also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, an NAACP chapter head, which was a white woman who wanted to be black. And um, a lot of times you get the idea of cultural appropriation. I know, for example, a lot of black women who loathe white women who go after black men sexually for, for relationships. Um, to uh, in your article that I read, John, and I'll link to that uh, and link to all of the websites uh, uh, for the participants below this video, um, what what are your thoughts about uh, uh, racial identity being as sort of slippery or as easy to move in and out of, say, as perhaps uh, sexual categories? Uh, and why do you think there was such an uproar, especially in, in black communities, about this woman who uh, was the head of uh, a local NAACP? Well, you know, I think it, the whole thing is very peculiar because the idea of moving in between racial categories that we generally agree don't exist. And so it's like, you know, switching rooms in a building that has been burned to the ground. You're still outside. And I find this to be very, very odd. And the black Americans who spent hundreds of years being oppressed by the notion that black is different and they finally get told, you know what, we're sorry, we, we realized we were wrong about that. Everybody's the same. And they say, heck no, they're not. We're different because we're black. When it worked out so well last time that you're determined to repeat it? I mean, Rachel Dollars, I think in, in some ways it's just a personal tragedy playing out as a political issue. There's something very odd about her and her life. But, you know, what does it mean to be black? If it means my skin is dark because I have a lot of recent African ancestry, fine. You know, I, I get that concept. But it says, well, it means that I have to, um, you know, what, 
misbehave in the face of the police or uh, you know refuse to study mathematics? Is this what you're talking about when you say be properly black? If not, if, if you're going to come up with a list of things that are good, why can't anybody do them? Heaven knows it's not as though the human race doesn't need to improve its behavior standards. And if you're talking about things that don't work out, why would you say, oh, well, you know, I know I shouldn't do that, but since I'm black, I'll do it anyway. Well, there's, no, there's no logic in that. And you got people who, who are trying within the black community to say, don't, don't buy into the negative stereotype and adopt it as a badge of pride. Like this, this horrendous you know, hip-hop style with the pants halfway down your butt and so on, which is meant to imitate people who are in a county courthouse and have their belts taken away so they won't hang themselves. If this is your role model, chances are you will wind up there. But it's got nothing. Why, why would you say, well, I'm saying I, I just think it's very odd that we would talk about racial categories being fluid or non-fluid because there's just one race. It's the human race. And we all want to try and do the things that are, are virtuous, that are good, that work for us and avoid things that are bad for us. And I don't think anybody should be told, oh, because you're black, you know, you, you have to do this, whether it's a good thing, like you should be able to slam dunk a basketball, or it's a bad thing, like you should be in trouble with the law and have no education and, you know, go around saying the N-word nobody else can say. I, I just think it's preposterous that we would think in terms of there being specifically racial behaviors. We would say to some guy, hey, that wasn't very Chinese of you. Um, th- this is not a statement that anybody should ever make to anybody else. It doesn't matter whether the person who's making it is Chinese or not. Well, thanks, John. Um, let me turn back to Nicholas Wade. And uh, in the 10 minutes or so that uh, we had, had lost uh, you, uh, I was talking with Sven and John about uh, 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 the his- history of uh, uh, homosexuality and also uh, whether race and uh, sexuality are fluid. But since you wrote a book about it, let me, let me turn back to how I wanted to uh, start this segment. And let's talk a, a bit about... Uh, uh, before you dropped out uh, about the history of uh, 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 races and whatnot. And it seems to me that both Sven and John are talking about uh, a very fluid, uh, for those people uh, wondering, we're just having some technical issues. Nicholas Wade had to drop out of the broadcast, and I'll probably follow up with in a month or two with him on a solo interview about his uh, book. But uh, let, let's uh, get back uh, to the topic on hand. I believe... Uh, we were talking about sort of the fluidity of race and sexuality. And uh, um, let me let me uh, turn back to Sven. Well, well, before I turn back to Sven, um, with the Rachel Dolezal thing, which was the last thing I believe that we were speaking of, um, do you think that uh, she would have been as criticized uh, in the reverse uh, if she was trying to pass, as they said in America, and she was, you know, a black woman who looked white, uh, and, and she was, say, trying to head, uh, uh, you know, some, I, I guess there's no, not any white uh, improvement groups, but uh, uh, if she was trying to, say, pass herself off as Armenian or, or some other white ethnic group, or do you think that, that it's just because uh, black America has, uh, has uh, been, has been uh, uh, in a minority position in this country that... Uh, uh, the, the fear was made because it seemed to be that someone from a majority group was trying to impinge on uh, a minority group. I think it was the, for people were puzzled by it because the, the idea of changing race just didn't really occur to them. I'm actually thinking of a comedian, a bit of bad of his, and he learned in Scotland of a mixed parentage and you know, half in, half in.
You're breaking up a bit there, so I'll, hopefully I, I can I get most of what you were saying there. Let me turn to Sven, um, because uh, uh, I had mentioned a, a Bruce Jenner, who now calls himself Caitlyn Jenner, and uh, I know I've seen him interviewed, and I, I, I've known what's now called transgender. 25, 30 years ago, uh, there, were, there were homosexuals, heterosexuals, and you know, there's transsexuals. Then you got the idea of transgender. Uh, uh, people like Jenner, for example, who presumably still has his testicles and penis, yet who dresses uh, as a female, calls himself female. Uh, 30 years ago, he would have been called a transvestite. Um, where, where does that fall on uh, the human sexuality spectrum? And is that even a form of sexuality? Since a Jenner presumably wants to have sex with women still, is he uh, heterosexual? Uh, where, where does that fall? And have you ever studied that? Or do you know anyone who's ever studied uh, this sort of gray area? Yeah, there's been a, a pretty amazing book written by a guy named Mike Bailey at Northwestern University, a professor there. And it's called The Man Who Would Be Queen. And he popularizes an idea that other people have worked on, which is that there really are two types of male to female transsexuals. And this kind of taboo topic, he was not well received by the uh, transgender community. And uh, so these two types are the following. There's basically what, what they call the homosexual transsexual. These are hyper feminine gay men that, as kids already, um, play like girls, act like girls, uh, play with girls, and end up typically transitioning very early because they very early on realize that they just function better as girls than as boys. Um, they typically uh, pass very well as girls because they are very, very feminine. And because they transition early sometimes, especially in European countries, they can uh, block the effect of testosterone, which um, before it hits in puberty, and, and just um, uh, just make it work really well. And there's the other type, which is called autogynophile. Auto means self, gyno, woman, foul, loving. So um, they love themselves as women. That is the that, that, that awkward name for them. And those are typically straight, very masculine guys that are engineers or maybe top athletes um, that have, have, get married and have kids and then at age 40 or something or 50 suddenly realize that for all of their lives really they were women trapped in the body of a man. And so um, they're completely they're completely separate, these two types. And once you, once you know them, you can spot them from, you can spot the difference <laughs> from miles away. And so what is thought, and this is very controversial and it's, it's not, 
it's not a popular idea, but what, what it's thought is that for them, there's there's a sort of sexual fetish almost in being a woman. And it's for them much more a sexual thing than it is an identity thing. Um, I hope someone else said this before about Bruce Jenner, and I'm not the first to say this, um, that he would fall in that category. But um, I, I don't know, obviously, what's going on in his head, but, but, but the, the, there's really two distinct types. And for that second type, because they transition very late, they're also not feminine. You never thought of, of Bruce Jenner that he was, mm. when he was an athlete, that he, that he, that he was very feminine. So they have to take classes to learn how to speak like a woman, how to sit like a woman, how to walk like a woman. And for them, it just doesn't come naturally. So there's really, um, there's really very distinct types. And I'm sure there's some people that are a combination or fall in the middle, but, but that's kind of the big secret that, um, that the transgender community doesn't really like to, to hear discussed. Okay. Let me... And that's so much saying that I'm Okay, let me let me just end this segment here, and when we get back, we'll talk a bit more, and uh, we'll try to get uh, a, a bit better uh, uh, feed here. So uh, let's end this segment and return in a moment. Uh, in this final main segment uh, with Sven and John, I uh, want to talk and, and sort of wrap some ideas up. Sven, uh, in the last segment, you were talking about sort of uh, an idea that uh, a lot of uh, transgender people aren't interested in, uh, uh, in in terms of two different types of uh, male transsexuals. And uh, I was I was wondering, because I've read people uh, talk about fetishism and, and narcissism in, in male homosexuality. And I know as a kid growing up, there was always the joke that the, the only thing more fickle and self-centered than a teenage girl was a gay guy. And uh, um, I wonder, I wonder uh, when you talk about that kind of hyper-masculine guy who may be uh, uh, fetishizing over his own appearance, his own, uh, you know, the guy who needs to have every uh, lock cone perfectly in place. Uh, in There was the, the film with Christian Bale uh, made about uh, American Psycho. He played that kind of narcissistic, self-absorbed guy, although he wasn't gay, the character wasn't gay. Um, is that the type of person that you're referring to, this kind of person who has to be always keeping up with the Joneses, has to have every latest, you know, app on his phone, has to have uh, every little thing to be, uh, uh, you know, with the in crowd? I don't understand your question. I understand the type that you're describing, but I don't really understand what your question is. Well, does that relate to that sort of hyper-masculine person, that, that the second type of uh, transsexual? Would that would they have those sorts of characteristics that they are more self-directed, like you were saying, rather than being uh, 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 thinking of themselves as women, they're more about themselves as individuals, irregardless of sex, perhaps? I don't really have anything clever to answer to that. Um, I don't really know. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, let, me, let me just ask, because... Uh, before I go back to John, who was still having some issues with, I know when I was uh, uh, young and single in my 20s and 30s, um, there was always the phrase, and it's probably still in, in, in personal ads today, you know, the women who go through their bi-curious lesbian phases. And I knew a lot of women, especially in the arts, who, uh, and uh, since we haven't talked much about female homosexuality, who would go through these phases in their teen years, college years, uh, or early to mid-20s, who would who would always be in that sort of bi-curious phase. Then you come back five years later, they found Mr. Right, and, and, and they right away have, have a baby. Um, earlier on, you had suggested that female homosexuality, uh, lesbianism, uh, was more fluid in a sense, in, in that uh, women may have had more of a, a choice. Uh, what do you think, if, if anything, might be a biological difference between the two sexes and, and their homosexuality? And do women over the course of a lifetime have a greater fluidity of, say, between the numbers one and ten on a sexual spectrum scale? Do they sort of bounce around more than men, do you believe? So, so yes, there's a lot of studies that indicate that, that for, for women on average, and again, there are exceptions, but on average, there's a bit more fluidity there. Um, and, and, uh, and that they have a, a bit more of a conscious choice. Now, we don't really understand from a biological point of view, how any of this works. However, the one thing that I can say is that there is some evidence that 
uh, for female homosexuality, there's a, a larger role for prenatal hormones. There's been this idea that's been circulating for decades that something happens in the womb where depending on how much um, male hormones you're exposed to in the womb, uh, that, that somehow affects your sexuality. And, and the studies that do support that really only support it in women. Um, so so there, there might just be a, a biological difference, but I think in general, um, sexuality is a very complex issue and, and I don't think we really understand much about um, how female or male sexuality works per se. Again, my focus has always been more like on the instinct of attraction yeah. more than on, on the, whole, the whole picture. And I think I think I read that you also had done research regarding uh, uh, sets of brothers, and that somehow uh, males who are born later down, you know, the, the third or fourth brother is more likely to be homosexual than say the, the first uh, born son. Is, 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 what what uh, can you talk about that for a moment? That's yeah, a very interesting uh, story. It's not my own research. It was um, Ray Blanchard, a Canadian, actually, has done most of the work on this. But um, this is called the older brother effect. And the more older brothers you have, the higher the chance that you're gay. Now, what's really interesting here is that it doesn't matter whether you actually know these older brothers. So if you are the firstborn and you're given up for adoption and adopted into a family with eight older brothers, you don't have a higher chance to be gay. So this environment that you grow up in doesn't matter. Now, if you're the eighth-born male and you've given up for adoption and you don't have any older brothers for your entire life that you know, you still have a much higher chance to be gay. So what really matters is how many male fetuses were in that same womb that you came out of. The only way that people can explain how this could work is with um, an immune response. So the, the idea there is, is that the mother really develops an immune response against this male creature living inside of her. And with every successive pregnancy, it kind of functions as a, as a shot of a vaccine, as an anti-male vaccine in a way that somehow, in ways we don't understand, um, gives these kids a higher chance to be gay. And so um, that effect is definitely present, but it's one of probably many effects. It's not going to explain uh, everyone, obviously. What's also interesting here is that that study has been, it's very easy to do, right? You ask people, how many other brothers do you have in the UK or straight? Um, so this kind of study has been done and replicated all over the world. So they have data that supports this um, effect in, in, um, in a large, large number of countries all over the world. Uh, John, uh, let me turn back to you and, and, and talk about, uh, since we lost Nicholas, uh, some of the things I want to talk about, uh, I'll have to wait until I can talk to him specifically regarding his book. But you live in Canada, and I wanted to know, um, Canada now, I think you, you preceded the U.S. by a decade or so in, in legalizing gay marriage, and Canada generally is, is, is seen of as, at least in America, as being more progressive uh, socially on a lot of issues regarding race and sexuality. Um, where is the state, for example, of uh, acceptance of uh, uh, people of different cultures uh, in Canada? And by that I mean, um, I, I, I was reading recently uh, after I had booked the, this show about something regarding uh, uh, native tribes up in, in uh, uh, the Northern Territories and them getting different forms of sovereignty. Uh, do you think that uh, in Canada there may be a breaking away? We've all heard of, say, French Canada wanting to break away. Do you think that uh, some of the native tribes of Northern Canada may try to form their own nation at some point? And if so, uh, what is your opinion on that? Because that seems to me a, a bit of self-segregation. And that's one of the things with race that has, has happened. And instead of getting a colorblind society, it, it seems that the people who were once oppressed because of their color are now trying to sort of fracture away in America uh, under their own sort of ethnic banners. Yeah, there's a very major problem when you're talking about not just North Canada. It's an hospitable place. Not a lot of people are Aboriginal or otherwise. But throughout, if they're politically correct, first name, everybody's talking about nation to nation, nation to nation, and Aboriginal still being effectively function in our nation, over 600 of them. They have only 100 members. They've got no uh, base. They have no way to make a list. If they were different nations, they couldn't print money, they couldn't police their own communities, they couldn't do any of the things that natives do. And they are obliged to these terms. One case of a community, who, uh, Mohawk, who basically chased 
breaking up a little bit there um let me let me uh, wind up uh, this interview with just a few questions here uh, uh I'll, I'll direct them to sven and then i'll uh, let each of you uh, uh end with a, a final statement um a couple of things i wanted to just ask uh, and i'm focusing on sven simply because you i you you've got the best uh, best feed coming sven so um i wanted to ask and this is a quest some questions that i've, I've heard over the years um to what degree do you think, and I, I know, for example, in the arts, uh, the ugly duck kind of syndrome uh, influences uh, people's sexuality. And by this I mean, and I'll, I'll just be frank, uh, if someone is very overweight or if they are considered physically unattractive, um, or I had mentioned earlier about, for example, uh, with, with black women in this country, for example, they are very, uh, you, you, you'll often see, for example, a good-looking black guy who might go for what might be considered a, a less attractive white woman to sort of move up socially. The same thing happens, I think, uh, with a lot of people who cannot find, say, a, a partner of the opposite sex. I've known, for example, the stereotype of, uh, say, you know, big, butch, overweight lesbians who congregate together. Do you think that there are some people, perhaps, that because of social pressures fall into uh, a sexual role or sexual identity or sexual relationship because of of external pressures because human beings tend to have a certain amount of plasticity um do, do you do you think that there's anything to that sven well the, the best example is um the long 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 history of gay men and women who marry in heterosexual uh, relationships because they believe that that was their only option or because they couldn't imagine uh, because of social pressure or any other way to live their lives. So people definitely are forced into um, into relationships that they're not necessarily happy in. I think that's been happening for, forever. Um, the other types that you describe, I mean, the, look, there's, a, there's a lot of people that have tried for, 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 for decades or centuries to um, to change people's sexual orientation, and that part just doesn't seem to work very well. So I, I do think that there's some something very innate um, that 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 can be changed. However, the type of relationships that people end up in, of course, is uh, is not biological at all. And I think there's a huge effect of, or, or, or when I say it all, not, not, there's a huge effect of environment. Obviously, the type of relationship relationships we engage in. Let me just ask two final questions of you, uh, and then I'll, I'll let you uh, close, and then I'll let John close. Um, uh, 
and th th this is more political, so this is your own personal opinion rather than scientific. And I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe in the article that I had read in Discover Magazine, uh, you were quoted or someone was quoted as saying that there was a, a, a very large percentage of homosexuals that were doing gay research. And I believe you, you, you had said that you were gay as well. And uh, I, I wondered, uh, what is your opinion on, say, the political culture within the gay rights movement in the sense that, uh, for example, back in the 60s and 70s, you had black pride and then you had gay pride. And logically speaking, if, you if, you're, if you're going to take pride in something, that would, that the thing you would say, well, if I, if I have a choice, I can only have pride if I have a choice in it. Uh, and so do you think that's just a semantic error people make? And the second thing was, uh, I've always found the, the term for bigotry against uh, uh, gay people, uh, homophobia, to be kind of silly. And I think it, it, it sort of buys into the, the old kind of uh, gay stereotype of heterosexuals that everyone's gay and that, oh, I'm scared to be gay. Whereas I think a more realistic term might be homotedium. Which, which would imply an uneasiness around homosexuals for whatever reason. Um, so let me just ask you just on a personal level regarding uh, the, the idea of gay pride and the choice of a term like homophobia in describing a bigotry against homosexuals. What are your own personal opinions regarding that? I, I totally agree with you on the homophobia part. It's a bad word, <laughs> and it's not a phobia. Uh, you know, I think most people are not afraid of homosexuals the same way they can be afraid of snakes or, or spiders. Um, so it's a it's a it's a bad term, and I I don't know exactly what what could work okay. better. Um, the other question, pride. Um, I think that I'm really not an expert here, but but I I think that in general, if you um, if you're a member of a minority, that could be anything. That could be because um, you're you're born with. Um, without arms or because you're gay or because you are a racial minority or, or, or anything else, I think you find um, support in people just like you and you want to form um, a community um, that helps you develop your culture and develops you um, sort of your, your emotional well-being throughout life. And, and so I think it's, it's kind of normal and logical that people find pride in what is often regarded as, as something negative by, by the general society. Okay. Um, uh, John, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just, uh, while I've got good audio on you, and I'll go back to Sven, if you could just uh, uh, wrap up in a couple of minutes your final thoughts on, on the matters at hand that we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, can you can you sum up in the uh, in a couple of minutes your final thoughts to end the show on uh, the the subjects we've been talking about, race and sexuality in modern life? Can you hear me, John? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you oh, hear me? Yeah. Go go ahead. Okay. I think the modern world really has all of this backwards. We've finally broken free of our obsession with race starting in the nineteen sixties. And now we've somehow gotten back into it. We're convinced that race is enormously important. Racial identity is enormously important. People go around saying black lives matter and getting angry at being told all lives matter. And I think, well, yeah, all the blacks are the criminals and all the whites are the police. But of course, there are thousands of black police officers in the United States and there are millions of white criminals. And then we see that gender doesn't exist and gender doesn't matter, although there is a distinctly female and better way of seeing the world, when Maleness and femaleness are so primeval that homosexuals have it too. There are lesbians who are more masculine. There are lesbians who are more feminine. There are gay men who are more masculine, gay men who are more feminine, of course. You know, and there are heterosexual men who are more feminine. But there is a fundamental core to it. There was recently a case of a transgender man to woman who had a problem getting through the airport screening because she had a penis. And they said, well, gee, are you a man or a woman? And they said, I refuse to answer that question. And so the TSA said, do you want to be searched by a man or a woman? And they said, no. I mean, this is, this is taking on uh, things just have ceased to And it isn't necessary to be anti or sexual to be masculine and feminine are categories that transcend physical attraction. And we need to get back to it because just putting women in combat, this is this is, this is a terrible thing to do to women. They're like, and it's half because money was that raised it back, gender didn't matter, and we're wrong this one and wrong the second one. And our solution then is to start deciding this matter. The modern world is upside this. Okay, uh, 
Thanks, John. Sven, if you could have a, if you want to take a couple of minutes just to sum up your thoughts on the matters at hand. Well, I actually like a, like a whole lot of what, what John said. And I think that, um, from, again, from my point of view as a, as a biologist, really, I think there's, there's a, a great in, interest in understanding how things work, just for the sake of it. And, and sure, there may be political implications of some of the work that we've been doing, uh, but as a biologist, you should be really curious as to how things work the way they work. Um, I, I do believe that um, we are moving, hopefully, to a society where unimportant things matter less and less. And by unimportant, I mean um, a society where, where people can just be who they are and whoever they want to be, in a way, um, without ignoring the fact that there's physical, biological, psychological differences between sexes and races. Um, um, I think hopefully we get to a place where people can just live their lives the way they want to live and be happy the way they want to be happy as long as they don't harm anyone. And so I think actually the next step is not um, now that we have, at least here in the States, um, mostly equal rights for um, equal gay, gay rights in a way. I think um, one of the next frontiers is going to a place where um, where you, for example, have the right to not have a sex, where you don't have to be male or female. So it's not so much about transgender rights, it's more about, again, the right to be just whoever you want to be. Well, I want to thank uh, uh, John Robson, uh, Sven Bachland, and also Nicholas Wade, who dropped out early in the show. Uh, had, obviously, some technical difficulties. People who have watched the show before, occasionally this happens. Uh, Skype is a free service. And hopefully I can have Nicholas Wade on for a full show to talk a bit more about his ideas uh, at a later date. But again, thank you to Sven and John. If you did enjoy this show, and I'll try to edit it to, to get it as best as I can, uh, next week, It'll be a totally different topic. I'll be talking with three experts on the life of and career of painter Andrew Wyeth. So uh, stay tuned for that. And again, thank you to Sven and John. You're welcome. Bye-bye.